Welcome back, America. Who'll stop the rain is my bump music. And that's in honor of the West Coast. And soon, all across the United States, I'm standing by waiting for Admiral Stav to join us on this. The, it's the first anniversary of the second Putin war against Ukraine. And Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, joins us, former Allied Supreme Commander in NATO, former head of Southern Command. Good morning, Admiral. How are you? Doing great, Hugh. How's it going? Uh, it's great. Now, Admiral, what I would like to know from you, if you're going to stand up, if you were back in your old job leading in the Fletcher School, and you were going to address a group of students about the unexpected course and future likely path of the second invasion of Putin on the first anniversary of it, what would you say? I'd say that Putin has a miscalculated therapy here, and he has led the nation Admiral, Admiral, we're going to stop and call you back for, for whatever reason we can't hear you. So we're we're screwed up this morning. We've been trying to make this work for a couple of days. Why don't we do it by phone? I'll have. Uh, I don't want people to miss this. I've been waiting to talk to the admiral about the anniversary, and, and I don't want to uh, have it distorted. And when it is, uh, because of you know, they're interesting. Starlink. Elon Musk needs to put a Starlink over the admiral's house. That's all I can say. That will help Hello. us all out in the world if, if Elon will post a Starlink over there. And we're able to connect with him. Uh, I would encourage all of you who have a subscription to the Telegraph, which is the Great Britain newspaper that I read. They have in there the five weapon systems that change the course of the war. And I want to ask the Admiral which one is the most important, but I also want to ask him, what do we have to do next? There he is. So, Admiral, let's, let's go back to the question I posed you. What do we do? The three things we should be doing at this point are, number one, provide the absolute maximalist amount of military capability. To the, Admiral, uh, it ain't working. Huh, uh, I don't know what's up. This is like a breakdown of the Starlink connection. Me? Now, Can you hear me now? We're, uh, we're going to drop your video. Nope, not yet. Um, we're going we're gonna to try again. And the echo has got to go away. And I think we are going to have to just call him on the phone. Are you there on the phone, Admiral? Yes, I'm right here on the phone. It should All be right. pretty clear for you. That's good. Go ahead. Okay, so here we are. We're one year into this thing, and I think the key question is, what do we do now? Uh, number one, we continue to provide significant military capability, and that, in my view, would include fighter aircraft, uh, notably MiG-29, F-16, both can be done. Uh, there are some naysayers who say, oh, it'll take a long time to train to fly the F-16. I don't know. These are trained combat pilots. We're not trying to turn Hugh Hewitt into a fighter ace. We're trying to get some... Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I think it's it's the armaments to include ATACMS, the uh, combat aircraft, the uh, uh, longer-range cruise missiles to go after the Black Sea Fleet, um, all of that. Number two, we continue... To, to push on the sanctions. And um, over time, that is going to have significantly more impact on Russia. And let's face it, the global energy economy is kind of rewiring itself in front of us. But long term, um, the, the, the economics are deeply against Russia, uh, point being that if you look at the global economy, on one side, U.S., Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada, uh, South Korea, Singapore, add all that up. That's about 65% of global gross domestic product. On the other side is Russia, which has maybe 2%, less than that now. Um, and even if China completely throws in, which I don't think they will, but if they do, uh, it's still only another 15% on that side of the equation. So over time, big, big storm clouds economically. And third and finally, Hugh, we've got to keep the diplomatic pressure on. And here where I'm worried is China. I'm concerned China may make a, a, a mistake here and begin supplying uh, weapons, real weapons, real military capability to Russia. Again, I, I think President Xi is too smart to do that. But 
that is the path of greatest glory. So there's three things we should be thinking about today on this anniversary. Uh, Admiral, I, I reminded my friend Kurt Schlichter the other day that China did not hesitate to throw hundreds of thousands of troops into Korea when they thought their strategic interests were threatened by MacArthur's advance of the Yalu River. And so if their strategic interests are threatened, they will act in their own best interest. But I don't think they are. Are they by, by Putin's defeat? Would, would they actually have their strategic interests threatened? No, I don't think so. And frankly, I could spin that the other way in two dimensions. One is it's been uh, 70 years since the Korean War. That's a long time ago. Point being, Xi can't have a high degree of confidence one way or the other in the Chinese military, point one. Point two, and, and more to the question of the strategic interest of China, I can make the case that a badly wounded, limping Russia with a absolutely cracked military coming out of this conflict presents a real opportunity for China. Think about it this way, Hugh. If you're China, you're looking north at Siberia. It's this vast land mass. This is Russia to the east of the Ural Mountains. And nobody lives there. There's, I don't know, 25 million people in an area the size of the continental United States. But what's it full of? Oil, gas, timber, arable land, fresh water, diamonds, gold, rare earths. It looks mighty tasty if you're Chinese. And a weakened Russia presents some interesting strategic opportunities to China. Now, Admiral, when the Chinese talk about the century of humiliation, it includes Russia taking their northern province, doesn't it? It does. And, um, you know, there's not a natural gravitational pull, frankly, between China and Russia. You, you provide one pretty good instance of it. Let's not forget during the Cold War, these two communist powers were never significantly aligned, had many disagreements, including philosophies of communism, but all the way to borders and geopolitics, as you correctly point out. And, and oh, by the way, go back to 55 days at Peking, uh, as it was called then, now Beijing, and uh, it's all part of the humiliation of China, which included Russia. Uh, now, now, let me talk to you before our audience goes off. Moldova is under an yeah. extraordinary... Have you been to Moldova? I'm going to be astonished if you've been to Moldova. Uh, Hugh, of course I've been to Moldova. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, uh, I think, twice, maybe three times. Don't forget, it's part of the U.S. European Command's uh, orbit. It's, it's area of responsibility, as it's called. So I've been... Uh, at least twice. It's it's one of the poorest countries, um, perhaps the poorest country in Europe. And the problem, its major problem, is about a third of its territory is already occupied by Russia, which has set up this kind of puppet regime there called Transnistria. And over the last few weeks, we've seen, I think, pretty credible reports that Russia is seeking to undermine the government in Chisinau, which is the capital. So, uh, here's the point. Russia is not only making moves on Ukraine, they're making moves on this tiny, impoverished country, Moldova, and they are also quite clearly intent on simply absorbing Belarus, which is a pretty big nation just to the north of Ukraine. The whole thing is part of Putin's, quote, master plan, unquote, to reconstitute as much as he can of the old Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Moldova, Ukraine, and uh, Belarus, of course, were all part of that. Does Bel Now, I know Moldova's elected prime minister does not want that, and I know that Russian propaganda is saying they're threatening the ammunition depot that the Russians control in that transiteria, whatever it is called. But does Belarus want to be absorbed? They've got their own little dictator going there. Does he want to give everything over to Putin? Yeah, this is uh, Lukashenko, who, who often jokes about uh, who's the bigger, badder dictator. It's, it's also kind of amusing to see him and Putin stand next to each other, because Putin's a tiny guy like I am, and, and his fellow dictator in Belarus just powers over him. Uh, he looks like Shaquille O'Neal standing next to huh. Danny DeVito. But uh, the, the point is, I think generally the Belarusians the population has no desire to be absorbed by Russia. 
Uh, the majority of that population pretty clearly wants to lean to the West. They've tried to overthrow their dictator several times. He, he has cracked down with help from Moscow. Um, this is uh, another one of the color revolutions, but one that didn't really take off. Um, came very close about two years ago, just before pandemic times. Um, the bottom line is, um, the Belarus would like to remain an independent country, but I think uh, Putin has other ideas for them. I want to close, Admiral, because you were the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. The only good thing that's come out of a war that's claimed hundreds of thousands of lives and destroyed Ukraine is they brought NATO together. It, it is going to bring Finland and Sweden into NATO. Poland, I read uh, two days ago, is going to put 4% of their GDP into becoming the largest standing army in Western Europe. Uh, what do you what do you think about the unintended consequences of this war on NATO, which you used to lead? Yeah, that, that distant boom you hear is Vladimir Putin's head exploding with frustration. Um, and these are all immensely unintended consequences from the perspective of Moscow, and and you've ticked them off very well. Um, of all of them, I think the most significant potentially is Poland, which has a great deal of antipathy for Russia, a long, bad history with the Cossacks and the Russians, and for them to stand up and, and move forward strongly, vital. Um, Germany is moving along as well, has created a, a special fund with billions in it. Um, Sweden and Finland, quite correct, they're going to present Putin with a new 800-mile frontier, plus put pressure on his plans for the Arctic. So, um, the, the silver lining here in this, in this horrific war is, in fact, NATO unity. Admiral James Stavridis, thank you for joining me this morning. Follow him at Stavridis J on uh, Twitter.